Thank you for joining us. I'm Francis Collins, the director of the National Institutes of Health, and I'm pleased to be here today uh, for a conversation with Dr. Aviv Regev, who is the head of research and early development at Genentech, but until very recently was a professor of biology at MIT and the Broad Institute. And she is, I'm proud to say, uh, the recipient of the 2020 Lurie Prize in Biomedical Sciences, an award bestowed each year by the Foundation for the National Institutes of Health. And I always get the privilege of interviewing uh, the prize winner. And I didn't want to pass it up this year, even though we are doing this all virtually this time because of COVID-19. And I've known Aviv for a while, so this is going to be a fun conversation. I will also say that we have some pride in her particular contributions because she was also a Pioneer Award winner from the NIH. I might also say that it's pretty unusual for somebody to win the Lurie Prize who's supposed to be a younger investigator, but who's already been elected to the National Academy of Sciences. So that ought to tell you something about Aviv and the way in which she has absolutely made amazing contributions uh, to our understanding of biomedical research, particularly in this area of single cell biology. So Aviv, welcome, and let's get into it. Uh, so maybe start off, what is so special about single cell biology and single cell genomics? What's the fuss? Hi, hi, uh, hi, uh, Francis. I, I think the genomics is because it allows us to see things that were either impossible or very difficult for us to see before about the cells that make up our body. So um, until recently, if we wanted to see which genes different cells express or use, we had to analyze a lot of those cells together, um, basically looking at their average. Uh, one of our favorite metaphors is that if you would think of each cell as a piece of fruit, then this would be very similar to making a fruit smoothie. What you would see in the end is kind of the average of all of the fruits, but not any one fruit in particular. So you wouldn't be able to say, you know, if some fruit was very rare in our smoothie, there were just a handful of blueberries in many strawberries, we might not be able to recognize the blueberries existed even at all. Or if we did, it would be just a smidge of what their, you know, actual characteristics are. And in the same way, if you have a very complex piece of tissue, for example, a part of the brain or the lung or the heart or the gut, then some of the cells that would be there would be very rare. And if you looked at all of them in aggregate and just check their average, you wouldn't be able to recognize these cells at all. And so what happened in the last several years is that we developed new lab methods and new computational algorithms that go along with them. And they allow us to look at individual cells. At first, we could just look at a handful of individual cells. And now we can look at very large numbers of individual cells, but each of them separately from each of the others. And so in a single go, we get to see all of the pieces of fruits in the salad. And from this, we can learn a great deal of uh, new biology. And this ability, I'm, you know, bespectacled. I have to use uh, eyeglasses in order to see. And I, I still remember the first time I got my glasses. I got them as a teenager. And before then, the world all of a sudden turned very, very fuzzy for me. And when I put the glasses on for the first time, everything came into this sharp relief. In that sense, you know, single cell genomics is like a new kind of glasses for us through which we can see biology in a much sharper way or a new kind of microscope in which we can see cells in a much sharper way. And I think that's why all the fuss is about, because they let us see pretty much every single aspect of biology in a sharper and, as a result, a better way and to derive much faster insights um, as a result of that. I think that's pretty powerful and appreciate all of the references to fruit. Uh, but also, uh, some have pointed out, I'm even fond of sort of reflecting a bit on this myself, what, what would you say are sort of the biggest uh, discoveries uh, of biology over the last many centuries? And people would say, well, probably that organisms are made up of cells. That's like right up there on the short list, maybe along with evolution and uh, DNA. Okay, let's take those three. But for most of the time we've been studying biology, we haven't been able to study cells one at a time. I mean, you could study cells in a Petri dish that were all clonal, and so you were kind of studying a cell, but you were really studying a lot of them. Or you could study individual cells by maybe some antibody to stain it, but you couldn't really ask that cell, what are you doing? So how does single cell genomics allow you to sort of ask, to query each cell, what are you up to here? How does that work? 
So, so what you do is that you try to look at the molecules that the cells have. That's the genomic side where we try to measure every possible molecule. So, for example, in the first large-scale successful technology in single-cell genomics is known as single-cell RNA-seq. And what we do there is that even though all of the cells in our body have the same genome and they have the same genes, they don't use the genes to the same extent. So a liver cell needs certain specialized enzyme, a brain cell, the neurons need uh, certain neurotransmitters. So they don't need the same genes, even though they have the same genes in their genome. The distinction is that they express those genes. And the way that they express those genes is that from the code, which is our DNA, cells express RNA, and this RNA is translated into proteins. So by seeing which genes are expressed, which genes are being used to make RNA from which protein, uh, from which protein will be made, we can look at which RNAs are being made and at which quantities. And that becomes basically the calling card of a cell's identity. You are what you make if you're a cell. You have your genome, you have the same set of instructions, but your identity is going to be defined by the genes that you express in the RNAs that you make. So in single cell genomics, what we do is that we actually profile those RNAs. And before, what we had to do is take a lot of cells and look at their RNA together. Now we look at each individual cell and we look at its RNA profile. And that gives us the calling card of a cell. So now if we have two different cells, one cell and the second cell, and we look at their RNA profile and their RNA profiles are similar, then we can say, oh, they're cells of the same kind. If we look at two different cells and the RNAs are very dissimilar from each other, we might say, oh, they're two different types of cells. So this would be like my fruits, you know, the strawberries versus the blueberries. But you also have to recognize that even cells of the same kind are not actually identical to each other. So right in the fruit analogy, you have many strawberries, but there's the big strawberries and the small ones, redder and less red, ripe and less ripe from each other. And those things are meaningful as well. And so the same is true for cells. You can have all of the cells be one kind of immune cell at some level. They're all T cells, for example, very important to fight your infecting viruses, but they're not actually all identical to each other. This T cell might actually be promoting immunity and that T cell might actually be shutting things off. And that's going to be reflected again by those RNAs that they express from their genes. So we can find these finer distinctions between the cells using these measurements. And now RNA is just one layer of what a cell has. There's methods to measure different types of proteins in the cells. There's methods to check which genes are on and off based on how the DNA is organized. And increasingly, we actually can look at all of these things together in one cell, or we can look at the cells not just when there are pieces of fruit in a salad and every cell is separated from each other cell, but when they're organized nicely in the tissue and we can tell which cell is next to which one. And if you want to carry the fruit analogy all the way through, we call these the fruit tarts <laughs> because the fruits are beautifully organized on the top of the tart and the same as the section that you take across the tissue. Oh, wow. I'm glad we got to the tarts. Yes, I can see what you're saying. Well, let's talk about some examples. And I have to start with one that's particularly uh, familiar to me because it was such a big deal when you and your team figured this out. Uh, my, my team, way back in 1989, found the gene for cystic fibrosis, a gene that nobody knew much about, and we tried to figure out what we could learn from it. It's called CFTR. And clearly, it's a gene that must be really important in the part of the body where cystic fibrosis is most apparent, the lungs, the pancreas, the sweat glands. But exactly how does it do what it does? We kind of figured, okay, it's in the lungs, it's in the airway. It probably isn't like every cell uh, in the airway. And then something happened. So what did you guys come up with that just blew us all away? So we were, we were, of course, not looking for the cells that express CFDR because we, like everyone else, assumed we actually knew which, which cells they were and that indeed they were very abundant cells in the lung and airways and in other, in other tissues. We were interested, we're kind of curious at what are the cells of the airways? And we started actually with mice. This was in the early days of the field. It was easier for us to get tissue from mice. We took the trachea, which is part of the airways, dissociated it to single cells, profiled those single cells. And at, the fr at, at first we were using one of the earliest techniques we had. So, you know, doing a few hundreds or a few thousand cells was a big deal. And out of several hundred cells that we profiled, if you remember, I told you the cells have these RNA calling cards and we group them together. Actually, an algorithm does that for us because the space is 20,000 dimensions and humans don't work that well 
in that space, mm-hmm. but it identifies things that in high dimensions are close to each other based on these profiles. And we get, you know, all the known subsets of the cells. There are cells called ciliated cells. They're relevant for, for, you know, CFTR. And there's basal cells. And there's some cells that are more rare. There were six kinds that we expected to find. The algorithm found all six, except that there were three more cells. And initially, it looked like dirt on the computer screen when every cell is is, is as a dot because it, there were so few out of the out of the many. But they were completely different. And the three were... And then when we looked at the genes that distinguish them from other cells, one of the top six genes was CFTR. And we were like, that can't be. It's supposed to be in the ciliated cells. And we go and we dig there, <laughs> right, in these little RNA sequences, and there's no CFTR. All the CFTR is in these cells. So first we gave them the very exciting name. Internally, we used to call them the hot cells because they seemed hot and cool. And then we were like, we would never be able to trust this result. I mean, there's literature from 30 years saying that they're in the ciliated cells. We don't see them. It's a fault of the method. So we did two things. The first is we took a new technology that we were developing at the time to do tens of thousands of cells and did many more cells so that we would get to larger numbers. And after we did that, the same result still held. There was this group of cells that we have never seen before that were expressing CFTR, and there were all the other cells that were supposed to express it and weren't there. And by that point, we started believing the result, but we still didn't believe it fully. We were like, maybe it's another part of the RNA, maybe it's some other problem. We will go back to the tissue with antibodies. And we took the whole collection of antibodies that detect protein in tissue and applied them to tissue from mice, and we couldn't find it. Uh, sorry, and we did find them stained. And then we were like, well, there's a discrepancy. So we took tissue from a knockout mouse that doesn't have the gene anymore. And we could still find the signal with the antibody. And uh, at that point, we were like, probably the old reagents were not good enough. And if you ask yourself, where do the reagents come from? Well, it's very hard to know whether you're actually measuring the thing you wanted to measure, because the only way to know if the thing is there is to use your measuring reagents. It's one of these difficulties that we have when the technology is just not there for us. And it was for us instead. So we had those cells. And then we realized that calling them the hot cells was probably not a winning proposition and didn't say a lot about what. So we started looking at the other genes that they express. And we found three that have not really been studied in humans or in mice, but they have been studied in the cells of fish and frog that um, are in, you know, uh, fish gills and in the skin of the frog, which are, again, interfaces with the world, just like our lungs are. And in those organisms, mm. they are known as ionocytes. So we decided to call these the pulmonary ionocytes, and a new cell type was born. Now, the cell was always there doing its business, being critical, actually, to the function, including to functions that we know are disrupted in cystic fibrosis, but we just didn't know it was there. And that has real implications, Francis, because... If you think about cellular therapies, cell, cell therapies for, C, C, for, for CF are something that people develop. If you're targeting the wrong cell, you wouldn't get the therapy. Exactly. And so, yeah, that was one of those mysteries, just, just like poof, opened up in this way. And it's actually a big thing in rare disease. In CFTR, CFTR had a head start because of, because of your beautiful work that people have been digging in it for many years. But in many initiatives, including the anti disease network which is an initiative from the nih we keep hunting for these rare genes and when you find a gene in the genome not all cells in the body use it because the cells in the airway use cfdr when the gene is defective you end up with an airway disease like cf but if it is a gene used by muscle cells then of course the disease would be a muscle disease and that's what happens in muscular dystrophy well in some cases it's not in an obvious place and so this information that we can now go after very rare things and find where genes are expressed is extremely useful in many diseases, including in rare disease. That's such a great story. And it totally did turn upside down what we thought we knew yes. about cystic fibrosis and along with big implications, as you said, for cell therapy, for gene therapy, for drug therapy. Oh, my. We had to sort of start over again. And we never would have figured this out without the single cell approach, finding those uh, three no. cells in your experiment that just didn't look like the rest. Do you have any other greatest hits when you look at the way in which single cell biology yeah. has like surprised everybody by uncovering some rare cell that nobody knew was there and then all of a sudden er, your understanding completely gets turned upside down? Does that happen a lot? 
It, it happens. It happens more than we think. I think there's two two versions of this in health and in disease. So maybe I'll, uh, you know, the the first study that we describe that I described with the ionocyte that was in healthy tissue first in mouse, then we validated it in the human. But um, and and a lot of such discoveries are happening. For example, in our brain, every day you can imagine we're finding a new cell. But we kind of expected that there. There, the number of neurons that we have in the brain is huge, and our expectation is that they're very diverse. We just didn't know what they are. But there's also places where things are hiding from us, and, and really we, we weren't knowing that we were searching for them. And that also happens for us in disease. So I'll give you two examples from disease. One is from, um, from cancer. So we think of cancer as a very heterogeneous disease to begin with. And a lot of the variations between the, both the tumor cells in the cancer, is the cancer cells in the tumors, so the malignant cells, but also non-malignant cells, cells of the microenvironment, the immune cells, the, the connective tissue cells, they're not mutated, they're not part of the cancer, but they're part of the tumor, they're inside the tumor doing their business. Those cells are very diverse and they're very different from each other, but those differences are more subtle. They're not about a new cell type. They're all cancer cells, but some of them are different from others. So one of our early discoveries around the cancer cells was in melanomas, which used to be very deadly tumors. They still are for many patients. And, and we found two types of programs that cancer cells run that really impact the response to therapy. One kind of program that characterizes cells even before the, the tumor has ever seen therapy, before the patients have ever, ever been treated, but it actually makes them more resistant to what we call targeted therapies, like those that target different mutated genes in cancer. And a second kind that we found was programs that cancer cells activate and make them exclude T cells out of the tumor. Now, one of the greatest advances that has uh, occurred in the last decade in, 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 in cancer treatment has actually been the development of immunotherapies. So therapies that unleash the immune system uh, in, onto the tumor, they've been tremendously successful for some melanoma patients, but they have been completely unsuccessful for others. These patients seem not to respond to immunotherapy. And we know now that some of the reasons for that is that those patient tumors do not allow T cells in. And we now found this program in a rare subset of patient cells, tumor cells, that actually excludes the T cells out. And once we find these programs, now we have a new therapeutic target that we can go after. So that's an example in, in cancer. There's examples like that also in non-cancer. So for example, in ulcerative colitis, which is a form of inflammatory bowel disease, again, there's immunotherapies that have been very successful targeting immune molecules known as cytokines. And when you target them, patients sometimes respond you know, miraculously well. But again, some patients don't respond and some patients develop resistance. So they're treated with a drug and it benefits them. And then all of a sudden it doesn't benefit them anymore. So we found this, this cell type a form of connective tissue cell called a fibroblast, but they assume a new kind or a new type or a new program in patients that is inflammatory. We call them now inflammatory fibroblasts and they actually feed the inflammation and they characterize patients that don't respond to therapy and they're actually predictive of the lack of response to immunotherapy. And there's more of these very rare cells or cells that are sort of out of place. There's a super rare cell type called the M cell. We usually see it only in the spine intestine. But in patients with ulcerative colitis, we see it in the colon. And it expresses genes that we know from genetic studies increase the risk of developing colitis. So these cells that all of a sudden pop out, out of place are like, a, you know, you're supposed to have a strawberry salad, here's a blueberry, that can be a sign of disease as well. There's many, many stories like that. Um, different kinds of astrocytes, which are brain cell and microglia, which are a brain cell that all of a sudden pop up in the brains um, in the context of Alzheimer's disease, which is a neurodegenerative disease, and so on. It's, it's yeah, all over the place. Wow. You know, one of the projects that I'm working on with the Foundation for NIH is supporting it is the Accelerating Medicines Partnership. And one of the things we're looking at is rheumatoid arthritis and actually getting biopsies of the joints of people who have active disease versus more quiescent disease. Couldn't help but notice you talked about fibroblasts that have taken on inflammatory behavior. That's exactly what we're seeing by doing single yeah. cell analysis in these synovial tissues of rheumatoid arthritis. So maybe there's a common theme here that we never would have been able to recognize without the single cell approach. So that's totally cool. 
So Aviv, not only have you done fantastic research uh, from your own lab uh, with an amazing group of trainees that flock to you in great numbers, but you also have put a lot of your time and effort encouraging the whole field. And you have, I think, been the main sort of push with a few other colleagues on something called the Human Cell Atlas uh, to try to make the most of this moment in scientific history where we can really look at single cells. So say something about the Human Cell Atlas. Why did it come to be and what is it hoping to contribute? So so I'll, I'll start with a little bit of history. So around 2014, we kind of had many of these pieces. So some of these stories I told you, you know, by the time there were a paper, it was later, but we've kind of had the results by then. We've, we've done the first study, you know, first of immune cells, and then we've done a study looking at immune cells inside mice in the context of, uh, of uh, an autoimmune disease. And we've had the first tumor studied, which was um, in glioblastoma. We started mapping cells where they're located in, in, in space, which we did in the context of zebrafish development. We started looking at how you might have um, new neurons being born in the brain. And along the way, developed kind of an algorithm toolbox that lets you ask questions of these very sophisticated data and the experimental toolbox that lets you profile more and more and more cells, more and more and more efficiently and ask a diversity of questions. So by 2014, we've seen enough of this. I would have had answers to many of your questions in 2014. They weren't as elaborate. There weren't as many examples, but there was at least one example of almost every type of question that we might want to ask. So it became quite clear that with the technologies getting scaled, we had Dropsic already kind of working in 2014. With the technology scaled like that, this is no longer something that you know should just be one or another lab's endeavor that we could just go and build an atlas of the human body. And you could say that started in, in the 1600s when biologists, for, when Hooke first saw uh, cells under the microscope, and people have tried doggedly to really chart the cells of the body ever since, but it was always an endeavor. It was always technology-driven. It could be the microscope or the stains or the fats. There were many technologies, but we never had this unifying technology that we could just apply everywhere and it would work right away. And so that became a really burning passion for me. I felt like we should just do it that the time has come and I started evangelizing for it. And actually the first time I evangelized for it was a talk at the NADRI. I was invited to give a challenge talk. Several of us were, were supposed to say, what could the NAH, what would you do if you had $50 million in five years? That was the way it was, it was, it was framed. And I said, why don't we make a human cell atlas? I, I made a set of slides. I showed that it was technically feasible. I even had like back of the envelope calculations. And I said, that would be really beneficial. It would, ask, uh, it would build a map. And we know that maps are extraordinarily beneficial for any human endeavor and definitely for biomedical research. And after I gave that talk, besides evangelizing um, in um, giving a lot of such talks, I basically stuck a, a series of slides like that at the beginning of any seminar that I would give. I would say, like, I'm going to talk about this, but first let me tell you about this human cell atlas thing. In early 2016, Sarah Teichman, who's a very good uh, colleague at the Sanger and now a very good friend, um, and I kind of got together by email and, and she said, I, I know you're interested in trying this idea of a human cell atlas. I'm interested too, why, why don't we talk about that? And we did, and we had a series of conversations and then with a couple of colleagues. And at first we were in the mindset of, we'll just go and convince somebody to fund this. And then we were like, we also need to have a, a real scientific plan. Let's, let's do that. And we invited 93 of our best uh, colleagues to, to London to a meeting co-hosted with a welcome. And um, many enthusiasts, including great colleagues from the NIH with uh, Francis's help. And we asked each other, should we do this? And the answer was, yeah, and we'll figure out how. And we spent a year, which we called the planning process between October 2016 and October 2017, actually mostly planning and launching, starting the launch of a data platform and some data collection efforts and so on. And but since 2017, we've been in, in full-fledged mode. And our mission is to create a comprehensive reference map of all human cells, uh, you know, for diagnosing, monitoring, uh, treating, understanding biology, understanding disease, uh, all of it in, in one fell swoop. And um, it's been going on great. It's an international initiative. It's open to all. 
Anyone who wants to adhere to the principles uh, is, is welcome. We are very committed to diversity, both in the data we collect in the Atlas, but also diversity in the scientists that make the Atlas. And okay, um, it's been a, a labor of love. That's how I put it. So Aviv, you've done amazing things, both for that kind of very large scale international collaboration, but your own labs, discoveries, uh, things that you've invented in terms of technologies and then applied them. But now you're winning the Lurie Prize. So tell me, what does that mean to you, uh, getting recognized in this way? So, so, so I'll start by saying that there's, um, I think for all scientists, um, there's something particularly meaningful when your colleagues recognize work that you've done. Um, first for me, it's the recognition of the work rather than the recognition of me. Because that work, as you pointed out, is never the work of one individual. First of all, it's the work of a lab, and I've been extraordinarily fortunate to have a wonderful lab with wonderful grad students and postdocs, but also at the broad staff scientists, research associates, colleagues who are computational and experimental, clinical experts and, and biologists, and beyond my own lab, that network of collaborators that works with you through this kind of problem. So that recognition of the work is not just a recognition of me personally, it's a recognition of this community that I belong to and that I'm very proud to have helped generate and, and mentor, but it is a community, it's not just one person. So it's that recognition of the work. I think for, for my particular field, that means even a little bit extra. Um, I come from computational biology, a field that strives to not just use computational tools to understand biology better, but actually use computational concepts to understand biology better. And a lot of the successes for single cell genomics have been because um, of a computational mindset. We devised biological experiments based on computational ideas. I think that's a little different than some other fields in biology. And the Luria Prize is not a prize from computational biology. It's a prize from the Foundation for the NIH, and it is a prize in biomedical sciences. And I think for my community, that means a great deal, that the things we do with our mindset of computational biology and genomics are biomedical science, not with a qualifier. They're just biomedical yeah. science. And that means kind of an extra, an extra big deal, uh, not just to me, but to me and many, many, many colleagues. And it cannot be done by any field alone. It's on, only in the convergence of these fields together. And, and I think that's a, that's a special moment in time for the field. And I appreciate it myself. Very well said, indeed. And I completely resonate with what you're saying about how computational biology has really turned to be transformative for everything we're doing right now. Aviv, what advice would you give a young student who's thinking about a career in biomedical research? Yeah, so funnily enough, I was actually asked that recently by an actual young scientist virtually online when I gave a Mendel lecture at European Society of Human Genetics. And so I gave an answer on the fly. And I actually liked my answer, but I have some additions. So I think my answer then was that they should follow their heart. Um, they should go to the right place that lets them carry out what their current mission is, and they should keep a very flexible mind. And I'm going to add to that three important things. They should also follow their moral compass. They should be generous to others and to themselves. Times are tough these days. And I think they should strive to do good in the world. If they do, everything else will follow. That is a wonderful way to exhort a young person uh, to take a path that is going to lead to great things and be true to themselves all the way along, as you have been, Aviv. You're such Thank a wonderful you. role uh, to so many people who are listening to this conversation. And I am delighted, having known you for a few years, that the Lurie Prize has been bestowed upon you. I can't think of a better choice in 2020 than you. So thanks for your willingness to engage in this little conversation. I wish you all the best in your new role there in Menlo Park. And once again, congratulations on the receipt of the Lurie Prize for 2020. Thank you so much. And thank you to the Foundation of the NIH for this honor.